We have with us now Larry Pittman, representative from the 82nd District that covers uh, a good portion of uh, Cabarrus County. Larry, please come up and let us know what you have to say. Thank you, Ronnie. I tell everybody if it wasn't for Ronnie Long, I wouldn't be in office. I really appreciate him and the team that he put together last year. Got me uh, elected to my first full term. Uh, I'm going to start out with something, and I hope uh, it doesn't offend anybody, but it may. Maybe some people here would be offended by it. That would not be a new thing for me. Um, but if you're offended, I'm sorry. You just have to be that way. Because what I'm going to tell you first off is this. No matter what happens in Raleigh, no matter what happens in Washington, no matter what happened the other day in Boston, West Texas, no matter what happens in Iran or Iraq or Kuwait, you know, or uh, Afghanistan or any of those places, no matter what happens in the election next year, or even local elections this year, uh, no matter whether anybody believes it or not, no matter whether I stand up and say the truth or deny the truth, here it is. Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, is the living and true God in human flesh, and there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And that is never going to change. Patrick Henry said that uh, it can never be emphasized too loudly or too often that this nation was not founded upon religion or, or by religionists but by Christians and it was not founded upon religion but upon the gospel of Jesus Christ and that because that is true is because of that that the other religions are free to be exercised here. If this nation had been found upon Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism, you wouldn't be free to be anything else. It's because Christians understand that you cannot be forced to be a Christian. Somebody can force you to say you're a Christian. Somebody can force you to say you believe in Jesus Christ. But you cannot be forced actually to be a Christian. You have to be free to make that decision for yourself where it's not real. And therefore we're willing to allow people to believe otherwise in order to secure that freedom. Jesus Christ came to set us free not to enslave us. And He doesn't force us to follow Him. But he does say, if you're going to follow me, you must be willing to deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me. And that gets misunderstood and misinterpreted a lot. Some people think taking up your cross means bearing some burden that you have to bear. Oh, my, my mother-in-law was such a... My mother-in-law is not, by the way. I love my mother-in-law to death. But my mother-in-law is such a pain to have to deal with. That's the cross I bear. No, that's not what Jesus is talking about. Or, I've got all these term papers that I've got to do before school's out. That's my cross I have to bear. No, that's not it. When Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me, He says, be willing every day if necessary to die for my name. That's what it means. And there were people in the 1770s who understood that. And you heard mentioned earlier about the Black Road Regiment. You may not have heard before that in those days the American Revolution was often referred to as the Presbyterian Rebellion. Uh, in fact, I heard that there was a, a Continental officer uh, who was an Episcopalian who was riding home he was out in the wilderness somewhere fighting the war. He 
wrote home and he said, uh, it's utter desolation out here. I'm surrounded by nothing but wolves and Presbyterians. <laughs> well, I'm a Presbyterian. And uh, Scott was talking earlier about pastors speaking up. I've told people in my church for years that I'm sorry if you're offended you know, if I talk about political issues, I will never stand in the pulpit and, pulpit and tell you by name who you should vote for. But what I do tell my people is that you need to be informed, you need to understand the issues, you need to know what people stand for before you vote. You need to know where Jesus Christ stands, you need to remember that you have an obligation to vote as an informed voter. And that if you're a Christian, when you go in there to vote, your vote belongs to Jesus Christ. And I will talk about political issues from my pulpit. And I have done and continue to do so. Because one of these days I'm going to stand before the King of Kings and he's going to say, did you say what I had for you to say? Did you tell the truth whether people liked it or not? He's my judge. I had a fellow in one church that I served that... Uh, he didn't like something I was doing or saying. And he, and he was probably the main financial contributor to the church. And He said, well, you need to do what the man who pays your salary tells you to do. To which my response was, you may pay my salary, but you're not my boss. My boss up there. So we need to speak the truth and we need to, to stand up. And I tell my church members, as far as discussing politics on the pulpit, why not be political in the church? Because we call Jesus King, we call Him Lord, and we call Him Messiah or Christ. And all three of those are political terms. Jesus Christ is the King. Whether we like it or not, it's not just some nice little story, idea that we tell in Sunday school and church and uh, we talk about Jesus being king and that's just a nice concept for us to want to obey what he teaches. No, he is the king. Whether the world recognizes it or not, he is the one to whom all will give account. And so as I serve in Raleigh, I try to stay focused on that. I try to remember that all the time. You know, and I've probably made some mistakes. There's probably some things that he's going to say, I, that was wrong, you should have done that. But I try and I pray, and I want you to pray for me, that when I push that green button or that red button, voting yes or no up there, I'm doing it the way he would. That's what I want. Because I represent about 80,000 people, and there is no way on God's green earth that I can possibly know what every single one of them want and do what's going to please every single one of them. So what I try to do is come as close as I can to understand how to please Him and hopefully everybody else will be taken care of. You know. But there are some good things going on in Raleigh, some things that are not as good as they should be, and there's some bad stuff going on in Raleigh. Some of the good things are that I'm not the only Christian up there, I can tell you that. We, uh, we get up there on Monday night, we have at 5 o'clock Capitol Commission, a Bible study that a lot of us attend, Republicans and Democrats. Not many Democrats, but some. Uh, and I hope they're not just spies. We have uh, on Tuesday mornings a prayer group that meets early at about 7 o'clock in the morning. On Wednesday at 12.30, we have chapel service, and lately that's getting, been getting packed out, and it was such a privilege a couple of weeks back to hear Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court, Paul Newby, as our speaker in chapel. Oh, wonderful Christian man, message. Um, and then we have a, a House or a uh, Legislative Prayer Caucus. Uh, I think we're the fourth state in the Union to, to establish a prayer caucus. So there are some good Christian people trying to do the right thing up there. And we have some, uh, some good bills that are coming through. Um, I want to talk about some of that. Um, I, I'm pleased 
well, I'm about as pleased as I can be, uh, about the voter ID bill that passed the other day, except it's weak. And some of the bad that's happening is that some of our leadership is squeamish about uh, going ahead and being bold and doing what the people want done. And uh, so some of us wanted to fix some of the weaknesses in the voter ID bill, and we were flatly told, you're not going to do it. Uh, we, were, we were told very clearly, don't bring any amendments, you know, unless it's just perfecting amendments, that sort of thing. Uh, so the voter ID bill is something we still need to work on, even though it hadn't been passed the Senate yet. Hopefully it will. I don't know if they'll do any improvements. I really doubt it'll get any better over there. Uh, it's something we can build on, though, and it, it, is, it is good as far as it goes. It is a step in the right direction. Uh, Carl Ford, I, I hate he had to leave. He's a good guy. That's, he's one of my answers to prayer because I prayed so hard for him to get up there with me. I'm glad to have him there working with me. And, you know, a few weeks back, we had this uh, resolution, not a bill, a resolution wanting to support the Rowan County Commission in leading their, uh, opening their meetings with prayer. And that... <laughs> Carl was the lead sponsor on that, and I joined him on it. I, when I read it at first, I said, Carl, we need to work on this, but time was running out, so he went ahead and filed it. We thought we would get a chance maybe to fix it in committee, because it wasn't quite what it needed to be. But as you probably are aware, the media got hold of it, blew it all out of proportion, made it something nothing like what we intended. Let me assure you, as I was saying earlier, I believe in religious freedom. You've got to be free to make those decisions. I do not. Neither does Carl want to establish an, an established religion. You know, that's not what it was about. It was about the freedom of anybody, whether you're a Christian, a Muslim, you know, whether you want to play, pray to Jesus Christ or Allah or John Paul, George, and Ringo, whatever. <laughs> that you have the freedom to pray in this country. That's what it was about. And I was still, you know, we even told them at the Cabarrus County Republican uh, meeting, uh, long about that time that, that we were going to try to go back the next week and fix it. Well, when we got back, I want you to know, Carl was uh, told very plainly, you will withdraw this or you will not pursue this if you want any of your other bills passed. That's exactly what he was told. So I want you to know that's not Carl's fault. Now, if it's his bill and he doesn't, I can't really do anything with it, I was just joining him on it. But he was pressured very hard not to push that. And you need to know that. The leadership. Um, speaker's office. And I'm, you know, I'm potentially getting myself in real trouble telling you this stuff because speaker's office don't want you knowing this stuff. Thank you. So, so I'm in trouble right now because I'm sure to get to it. That means probably none of my bills will go anywhere, but they're not going anywhere anyway. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that's happening. It really amazed me. You know, I was, I was proud to vote for Tom Tillis uh, to be the speaker again when we got back up there this year. Because last session he was great. You know, I thought, man, nobody could be more fair than this guy is. But now he's running for U.S. Senate, I plan to. Things have changed. They tell us all the time about how bad it was when they were in the minority and you couldn't get the, you know, the Democrat leadership wouldn't let them get their bills moved or anything. Well, now the constitutional conservatives in the Republican part of the House know what that's like. I have two gun bills. Uh, we were talk they were talking earlier about uh, the bill that they pushed through, House Bill 937 that, that we're working on. Let me tell you about that. I have two bills, House Bill 246, the Gun Rights Amendment, and, and one that uh, Glenn mentioned earlier, House Bill uh, 624, the Enabling Patriots Act. And um, 
there's a color code system that the speaker uh, gives to what you know committee chairs when those bills are sent to committee they're either coded green yellow or red uh, those two gun bills right now are coded yellow which means for the moment they're not going anywhere could be changed and I'm you know I haven't given up on it yet I'm still trying to do something with them but in the meantime you know and some of you know this because it was in my newsletter I was told that uh, three of us were going to get together and meet. Some of the freshmen insisted I be included in that. Um, we were going to get together and meet and, and come up with an omnibus bill, omnibus bill that was going to bring all the good parts of the gun bills together. Well, I went to that meeting. Not the three of us. It was at least 12 of us in there. Um, certain member was uh, heading up the meeting running the meeting and they kept making this suggestion that suggestion about what and I said that's in my bill you know or, or you know my bill deals with that but it's a little stronger than what you're saying you know I was totally ignored and this lady who was running the meeting said well I don't necessarily need to have my name on it uh, we, we need a lady though so they put Jacqueline Schaefer on there and I love Jacqueline she's a great lady and uh, tickle to death, you know, have her and support something she does. But uh, Michael Speciali from Newburn, who would be my representative, I still live down there, um, insisted they put my name on the bill. I said, well, you know, it's really not my bill. It's, it's okay, I'll support it, you know, if it comes to the floor, but uh, it's really nothing for me to get all excited about wanting to put my name on. So we got House Bill 937, and I will vote for it when it comes to the floor because it does do some good things. But our state constitution needs to be changed. They've got language in there against concealed carry. It needs to be taken out, and we need to say that this state will not confiscate, have a general confiscation of weapons. And they're ignoring that. That's in my first bill. And, and they're ignoring that. And uh, I have some provisions in the Enabling Patriots Act about, uh, well, actually, when it came back from bill drafting, they had taken some of this out, so I'm going to have to put it back in if it ever gets heard in committee. Uh, I had specified that students, faculty, and staff in uh, colleges and community colleges uh, could, uh, could do concealed carry as long as they just, all they have to do is just let security know they're going to do it. Um, some may think they shouldn't even have to do that, but I felt like that was about the only way I could get that passed. And also that principals who have concealed carry and teachers who have concealed carry, I've, I've spelled out how they would be allowed to carry on K-12 through campuses. Well, that's too controversial. It might hurt somebody's Senate campaign. And so that's not going to go forward unless I can get some support for it. How do we support? How do we help? Well, you can let as many of them know that you want it passed. You know, just the other week when we had uh, House Bill 17 and they had taken out the uh, restaurant carry, and I was going to try to put it back in, uh, there were people were getting five and six hundred emails and. They had to come to me and say, look, we're going to get this taken care of. Don't you know, call them off, you know. <laughs> okay, you want my bills passed? Let them know. Uh, but I'm going to have to do a lot of footwork going around talking to other representatives and senators and try to get their support. Uh, because what I'm being told is, if you can get uh, enough senators to support it, we'll let it run. And, you know, what that probably means. Um, I, I hate that the lady over here left before I could get up because she asked about Common Core. The bill that she was asking Carl about is actually my bill. Um, I've heard so much concern and complaints about Common Core that I originally wanted to run a bill that would just pull us out of it just like that. And it became pretty clear that not enough people in Raleigh know enough about it to be willing to do that. They looked at that as a knee-jerk reaction, you know. So I said, okay, well, let's do a study bill. And um, 
So I'm running a study bill to have Common Core study to see what's really in it, to get our legislators educated about it so hopefully we can get out of it. But I had a meeting in the Speaker's office the other day, the four of us who are primaries on that bill, <coughs> and Linda Johnson, Chair of the Education Committee, uh, was there to talk about how Common Core is such a good thing. So that may get derailed. I'm trying, I'm trying to get us a, a decent study bill and do something about that. But anyway, that's just to give you an idea of why we're having the problems we're having in Raleigh. And we need more people who understand the truth. And I, I hope that I can stay up there next term and we'll get some more good folks, we'll get some different leadership, then I think we can get some things done. God bless you. Now you all see why I'm proud to call that man my representative. And yes, I did work my fanny off to help him get elected, and I'll do it again if you'll give me the opportunity to.